Hey folks, welcome to our church from home service today because of bad weather. Of course, if you've been watching the news of the Weather Channel, you know that bad weather is all around us. So please be in prayer for those who are uh, a little bit south of us over in South Carolina and Georgia and a little bit north of us in Tennessee. Um, they're getting hit pretty bad right here in our area, Newport. We're not getting hit too bad at all, but we do have one of our church members who are going to be driving home from Nashville because of work uh, to get in today. So please be in prayer for him if you would. But we um, are coming to you from home today. Like I said, we canceled service because we have many that are sick and many that are dealing, well, like I said, with just the weather, not wanting to get out and get in some kind of trouble. But we're so excited to have you with us today. I want to talk about Samson. Uh, over the years in my ministry, I have I have dealt a lot with the subject of failure and of course every one of us are prone to failure that's just part of the human disease is that we um, we mess up we make mistakes we go through moments and times that you know we're, we're on our game we're doing good and every person no matter what what walk of life they come from has to deal with failure at some point in their life some people learn from it and some people learn to conquer it some people get better but some people do not and um, so it's a subject that is a very sensitive subject, I believe. But um, one, one of the keys that I feel like is, is helpful in dealing with failure is the condition of our mind. Uh, I want to go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, a very familiar, uh, verse 1 and 2, a very familiar portion of Scripture that I want to read to you. And Paul is saying, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He said, be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Uh, one of the examples in the Bible that I want to use today is is Samson. Um, to me, S Samson has always been one of those intriguing characters. Um, of course, you know, being being a, a a kid growing up and looking to superheroes, and then getting as a teenager and doing the what most male adults do, you know, trying to work out and get big muscles. You know, we um, we trying to fulfill that male ego. Uh, Samson's always been one of those guys that's been real intriguing over the years to me. Um, of course, first of all, how how mightily God used him. And so we're, I want to talk about the power of a renewed mind. And I want to bring Samson into this. Um, and w one of the things that I think that really Samson had issues with was pressure. Uh, sometimes, you know, we, we deal with a lot of pressure. Sometimes we create our own pressure. Uh, as we try to live up to some people's ideals or we try to live up to what people think we should, uh, whether it's a, it's a job or whether it's a career or whether it's something that you're passionate about that maybe, you know, you, you've been very vocal about that people have seen you in, involved in, and maybe you've messed up in it and, and you're trying and trying and trying. Uh, there's, there's pressure all around us. I mean, life itself just brings its own source of pressure. And then there is the pressure that comes from the enemy. If you're a child of God today and you're doing your best to live for God and you're fighting the good fight and you're battling and you're getting through this world, then you've got an enemy called Satan that is trying his best to put pressure on you to quit. Now, here's the thing about pressure. Pressure always creates some kind of change. Um, it's Whether it's good or, or whether it's bad. It's amazing that same pressure that, you know, if you were to fall in a hole and dirt was to fall in on top of you, that pressure can kill you. But yet that same pressure has been working for hundreds of years to create diamonds. You know, so, so pressure is good and pressure is bad. Pressure can be a good thing that causes us to be determined to live for God. And if we allow it to shape us in who God wants us to be. But pressure can be very detrimental when it begins to cause us to lose that source of deter uh, that, that that source of determination to live for God. Like I said, and I want you to keep this in mind as I'm talking today, that pressure always creates some kind of change. You know, as the Bible goes through the story of Samson, 
you know, God, God used people in, in the book of Judges, which were called Judges, um, to, to help lead the people out of, out of bondage, to help lead the people out of situations. And Samson was one of those from the tribe of Dan. And, and the, 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 whole, the whole story of Samson's birth and the angel and his parents were barren, they were old. Many times in Scripture you find that scenario itself. Um, you know, many people who were enabled to do something, but yet through God's supernatural power, they were able to overcome the odds. And, and so Samson's story from the very beginning is a story of overcoming failure, overcoming pressure, because there was tremendous pressure back in those days for a woman to have a child, especially a male child, to carry on the, the family name and to carry on the strength of the tribe. And, and so, so from the very beginning, you see, see this pressure coming into play, and yet you see this failure but yet God begins to intervene and God's Spirit begin to move upon Samson. And that strength that would come from the Spirit of God moving on him uh, enabled him to do things that m most men could not do, normal men could not do. Uh, he was given this strength, not, not to parade it around, but he was given this strength to deliver Israel's em enemies, to deliver Israel, excuse me, out of the enemy's hand. Uh, God gave him this tremendous strength to serve. Um, and God will give us all strength to serve Him. I know maybe some of you right now are struggling thinking, I'm, I'm not doing a good job living for God. Maybe I'm not serving God to the best of my ability. And sometimes, you know, we can only do so much, but there is a strength that comes from God that enables us to, to serve Him. There's nothing wrong with asking God, God, give me the strength, give me the determination, give me the want to and the desire to serve you because there's so many things that are, like I said, coming against us with pressure, trying to discourage us from living for God. Um, and even though Samson, like I said, had the superhuman strength from God, had a, had a very miraculous beginning to his birth, um, he had to deal with pressure. Now, not all of us are, have a call of ministry on our life, but the Bible is very clear that God has given us all gifts and, and talents that He wants us to use for His glory and for the kingdom of God. Um, every one of us have been called to serve Him in some way, and like I said, with that comes pressure. I mean, how many times? It, I mean, how many of you have ever got up, get up to sing and forgot the words? I mean, or been uh, done a Christmas play and it was time for your line and you forgot what your line was. I mean, that that's not because uh, you didn't try or you didn't study or you didn't apply yourself. It's just pressure. Pressure makes us nervous. Pressure, and when people get nervous, they're more liable to to make a mistake. So that's that's what it it is about. You know, we're we're dealing with those issues in our life that we want so desperately to fix and yet we try or we want so desperately to accomplish and we try and we get nervous and we fail or like I said you're dealing with pressure from an enemy who is afraid of your success. But living for God and serving God is, is the most important thing that we can ever do in our life. I mean don't Jesus said I come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. I mean that that life that he talks about is not just a life of blessings but a life of being an overcomer. I mean look at look at Paul and the disciples and, and all those guys in the Bible that were willing to lay down their life for the gospel. I mean, they were living life. I know we talk about, well, yeah, they, they went through troubles and they were always in something, always something bad going on, always something bad happening. But, but they were living to them. It was, it, they counted it as glory. They counted it as, wow, I'm worthy to serve Christ because look at the troubles that I'm having. I mean, it made them, it made them their life worth living and worth dying for. As it says in the text, and Paul said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Do you understand what a living sacrifice means? It means, yes, you're alive, but at any moment, like Paul said, he said, I am ready to be offered. My life can be taken from me, but to live as Christ, to die is gain. So when we talk about living for God, and, and I, I feel the Holy Ghost talking to you about it now, when we talk about serving God, look at the life that we have, that this life is just a shadow of the life that is to come. Because if we lose out in this world, we have a heaven to gain. And there's not a one of us today that can fathom the beauty and the glory and the splendor of heaven. So, no, I'm not looking to die. I don't have a death wish, but if I do die, I know where I'm going. So, uh, you know, so, so live your life for God. You're going to be amazed at the things that you can do through God, when His Spirit moves in you and on you and through you and is working and transforming your mind and, and creating 
uh, your life to be who God meant you to be. It, you're going to be amazed at what you can do for God and how His Spirit and His presence can help you overcome pressure. You're not the first person to, to feel pressure. I mean, at Jesus' trial, when He was being on put on trial, uh, Simon is standing out there, and you know the story how when Jesus told him when the rooster would crow three times, you would already have denied me, and he denied Christ, and he denied knowing Jesus. But yet, after Pentecost, after the, the Holy Spirit is poured out, he, he is bold, and he preaches the first apostolic message. And from that point on, Simon Peter never wavered in his life and in serving God. He didn't bow to the pressure any longer. And the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost can give us the strength to live for God and the strength to live out our destiny. When we begin to yield ourselves to God, instead of trying to take these things into our own hands and trying to somehow uh, show God that we're big enough to handle these things, God doesn't want that. He wants us to yield ourselves to Him to realize that in our weakness, He shines through. In our weakness, He steps into the situation. When we allow Him, when we yield ourselves to God, He shows us that through Him, pressure can disappear. God is your strength. Any strength outside of God doesn't have the power to last. I mean, we're going to last so long because we have a certain amount of knowledge and we have a certain amount of determination, but there's going to come a moment when all that's going to reach a point you're just going to end and you're going to need God. But His strength, the Bible said, is made perfect in weakness. The weaker we are, the greater His strength is seen in your life. So when you feel weak, when you feel wrung out and strung out and wore out and, and all these things, realize that God's strength in you can help you outlast any pressure that you feel. So be encouraged with that. Be encouraged with that. Samson had an issue in his life that created the wrong kind of pressure. Samson was attracted to the world. I mean, I don't, I don't know if Samson, Sam, excuse me, that's kind of hard to say sometimes, Samson's strength and his ability begin to create pride in him. I mean, if, if you can look at sin, um, the number one issue just about in any kind of sin is pride. I mean, when we rebel and we do things that we want to do and just because we want to do them, no one can tell me what to do. That's, that's pride. Most, most issues in life and sins in life and problems that deal or stem from pride. Uh, Samson loved the very people God had called him to destroy. Like I said at the beginning, you got to remember and keep in mind, pressure cr always creates some kind of change. So Samson fell in love with Philistine women. He couldn't seem to, to break his addictions, we might want to call it, um, to the world. Even being told and even being, you know, scolded by his parents and corrected and, and you know, like, Man, what's going on with you here? You're not, you know, that's the enemy. That's 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 who God had anointed you to rid His people from. You know. So the question I want to ask is this: What is what is our view of the world as Christians? How do we view the world? Well, I'll put it like this. And, and of course, number one, the world is our enemy. The Bible said that it is enmity. Enmity between God. I mean, the world is our enemy, but yet at the number two thing is the world is our harvest field. So we have an enemy in the world, the in, the adversary, the devil. We have sin and we have the uh, all these demonic influences that, that are in this world that we are fighting against that is our enemy. But yet at the same time, there are people who are bound and people who are uh, in trouble and people who are outside of the fellowship of God that that is our harvest field. It is our enemy because the world is constantly trying to change who we are and draw us away from God. But yet it is our harvest field. And that's why sometimes the battle is so intense because you're dealing with the spirits of this world, the principalities and powers and wickedness that is in this world, and yet at the same time, we're trying to reach the loss. And the spirits of this world are trying to change the way we think by appealing to our senses, and we're seeing that more now than ever as this liberal mindset and this uh, liberal agenda that is in this world, and it's nothing but just from the very pits of hell itself that is trying to get the church to adopt this mentality of, oh, it's it's their life, they can do what they want, and, and everything's okay, we just need to be kind and love each other. No, it's a lie. It is an absolute lie, and we've got to fight that. And, and 
and the enemy tries to appeal to our senses. Samson saw a Philistine girl and he fell head over heels in love with her. And, and like I've said many times, he was all brawn but no brain. I mean, not, not even his parents could change his mind. And here's the thing. We've got a mind. God gave us a mind. And the Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need to think like him. The Bible tells us, the Bible is very clear about the way that we think, and it is important because that is where the battle is. The battle is in the mind. And the mind is going to control what we do, it's going to control what we say, it's going to even control how we feel. Because you can think about something sad, and before you know it, you can end up feeling sad. I mean, it's amazing how the mind works. But I'm telling you something, the enemy is afraid of a child of God who has a made-up mind. The enemy is fearful of a child of God who's got it up in here and says, you know what, I don't care what the world thinks, I don't care what the world says, I don't care about how the world thinks. I am not being conformed to this world. I have been transformed by the renewing of my mind. Hallelujah. I mean, do you know how much damage a child of God can do to the enemy's kingdom when we are sold out to God? The Bible says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Do you realize as we allow the spirit of holiness to begin to work in our life, it's going to begin to transform our mind? I mean, it is absolutely amazing. Jesus said this. He said, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. That doesn't mean, I want to make it clear, the church is not some little little, little band of merry men running around hiding out in Sherwood Forest, doing, doing a few good deeds every now and then. I'm telling you, the church is a force. The church is a power. The church is, is the kingdom. It is a kingdom. It is the kingdom of God. So stop letting the enemy make you feel like you're just some little fella running around and you don't, you're insignificant and you don't mean anything. Yes, you do. You are a, the a part of the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. You are a child of God. You are royalty and you know this. No devil can stop you when you have your mind made up to follow Jesus. Determination. Now here's the thing about it. Determination is not measured by words. It is measured by your actions. When you make up your mind to follow Jesus at any cost and you are living your life for God with all the muster and strength and power and vim and vigor and vitality that you've got, let me tell you something, friend. You are going to be an overcomer. Make your mind up to follow Jesus all the way. So, so, so Paul deals with this issue. He says, be not conformed to this world. And I want to describe I want to describe what that means. It means to change one's mind and character after somebody else. Paul said, don't change your mind and character after this world. In other words, don't let the world's thinking change your thinking. Because your thoughts can shape your character. We're not supposed to be like the world. We're not supposed to think like the world. And, and, you know, and I know some people that watching maybe wouldn't, wouldn't even agree with me, but there's a lot of things you're, that we do, maybe you're doing them right now, that don't bring any glory to God. I mean, when I, when I, and I'll just be honest, when I hear about Christians watching Harry Potter, I've got a problem with that. And like I said, that's just, that's me. I just don't think that there's some things that, that we, we allow in Christianity that we don't need to have in there. And... Of course, you know, work out your own salvation. You're, you're going to be responsible at the end of the age for how you live for God. So, I mean, I, I, I can talk about my feelings and talk about what I feel like is right or wrong. But at the very end of it, it's going to be you and God standing there and, and you're, going to, you're going to have to work out your own salvation. But, but I mean, you, you know what's right and wrong. I mean, no one's got to tell you. But we face pressure every day, and that's what I'm talking about. That's what we're having this discussion today. We're talking about pressure, pressure every day. A world who tries to get you to copy them. You know, you know, and, and looking at the Bible, there's so many examples. The seven sons of Sceva, who was a Jewish priest, saw Paul casting out devils, and, and, and they, they tried to do it too. And they said, we, we adjure you, or whatever they said it in the name of, of Jesus to leave. And, and the devil spoke back and said, well, I know Jesus and I know Paul, but I don't know you, you know? You, you've got to have a relationship with God. That's where your strength comes from, without a relationship with Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. Does, does the world know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Does the devil know you got a relationship with Jesus Christ? I mean, you never want to get in a, in a battle with, with the enemy and, and the enemy looks at you and say, I don't know you. I mean, you've got to have something that identifies you 
with Christ, the Spirit of Christ, the power of God, the power of the Spirit living inside of you. And, and, and so, so Paul, because of his experience and his relationship with God, said that to the church, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. That means to imitate or to copy. He said, let me show you how to live a life of power. Let me show you, Paul said, how to beat the pressure, how to say no to the world, and how to say yes to God. Because here's the thing about pressure. Pressure leaves an impression. I've got a, a, a notepad, and, I, and there's a cover that I got, a thick cover that goes over top of the notepad that, that I preach with. And, and I hadn't used it in a long time. I had set it up on my shelf, and something had got set on top of it. Well, when I went to use the book, I noticed that there was the impression of what was sitting on top of it. The, the weight of what was sitting on top of this notepad left an impression on the cover. That's what pressure does. Pressure leaves an impression. So these things in our life that are pressuring us, that, or maybe that we're allowing to pressure us, pressure us is leaving an impression. Don't let the world change you. Don't let the world break you. You are a child of God, and you've been called to change the world, so never forget who you are. I love what 1 John 4 and 4 says, For ye are of God. You are born again of water and of spirit, and have overcome them, talking about the spirits of the world, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. My God. When you realize who is in you, what's inside of you, that you're greater, more powerful because of what lives in you. The Spirit of God and the power of God is greater than what spirits are in the world. That's why Paul said, don't be conformed by this world. He said, don't let the enemy deceive you. Don't let the enemy lie to you. Don't let the enemy warp your thinking. He said, be not conformed. Samson flirted with the world. Of course, you, can, you know the story of Samson. You can read it. And it cost him dearly. He lost his anointing, he lost his strength, he lost his eyes, and he lost his freedom. See, conforming to the world begins with a thought. Every day, there's, there's millions of thoughts going through, not, maybe not millions, but thousands of thoughts going through your head every day, things that you, you don't even know are going through your head. I mean, that's what one scientist is talking about, thoughts. And, and, and the world tries to blur the lines between right and wrong by blurring, by, by filling our mind with lies. You know, the, the enemy tries to make everything gray. And it's, it's black and white, friend. It is absolutely black and white. But the enemy tries to make it gray. And the same thing happened to Adam and Eve. Oh, you're not, you're not going to die. Not right then they weren't going to die. But they lost their immortality. And they end up dying. They lived for hundreds of years, but they did die. So the enemy's a liar. The enemy is a liar. And, and, but the enemy began to work on Adam and Eve with trying to change the way they think. So you got to understand... If you're presenting your body a living sacrifice to God, that means your thought life too. It doesn't just mean your physical body. It means your spiritual body, your mind, your soul, your spirit. And, and, and the Word of God is the very thing that is supposed to shape the way that we think. The Bible said, let this mind mean you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Then the Scripture says, as a man thinks in his heart or a man thinks in his mind, so is he. Your mind is shaping your actions, but who or what is influencing the way you're thinking. That's important. Samson knew better, but Samson ignored the voices in his life that were trying to help him. I mean, I've heard people say, yeah, I go to church, but I ain't going to have no preacher tell me what to do. I'm going to live the way I want. I'll go to church. No, God put pastors and preachers and evangelists and prophets and apostles, he put them into our life to warn us and to help us. And we need to heed the voices around us, the voices that are telling us the right thing, the voices that are telling us, the people that God has put in our life to say, listen, let me warn you about this. Let me tell you about this. Let me... And stop listening to the voices of the world. Friend, this, this, this is serious. I mean, this, this is really serious. And, and of course, today I'm talking to my church, first of all, uh, Foothills Worship Center, family. I, I forgot at the beginning to, uh, to welcome them because, um, man, what a great church we have. My goodness, I, I can't even begin to describe what a, what a tremendous church we have. Absolutely just tremendous church. But I know there's a lot of you out there that, that watch um, this, you know, every week. And, and I, I want to encourage you too, just to
to block out all those negative voices, block out all those liberal worldly voices and all those things and focus your attention. Because the Bible said, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith. Hearing's got more to do with just listening to somebody. Hearing has a lot to do with obedience. He that has an ear, whose ear is tuned, he who is looking, listening for the Spirit to speak. He that has an ear, let him hear, let him obey, listen to, carry out what the Spirit is saying. I mean, Samson found himself with no strength. He shook himself, the Bible said, after that last encounter and, and Delilah cut his hair off. He shook himself, but the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. They took him, the Bible said, and they gouged out his eyes. They, can you imagine how horrible that feels? You know how, you know how horrible it is when you lose your vision? You know how horrible it is when you're a child of God and yet you can't see your way out of something? You can't see the end of something? You can't envision something powerful for your life? And you lose your vision? Can you imagine how it is to lose your freedom? Here's, here's the bottom line. The devil wants you weak. He wants you with no vision. And he wants you to become a slave to the thought life of this world. All to eliminate a threat to this world and somebody in this world who doesn't know Christ being changed. That's what it's all about. It's to destroy you and to keep you from reaching somebody else for the gospel. The world is trying to stop the transformation that God is working in you. We, every day of our lives, Paul talked about being renewed daily. Our lives are in this constant metamorphosis as, as we allow the Spirit of God to work in us. The Bible says that through the power of the Holy Ghost, there is righteousness, peace, and joy. And the thing about the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is, it, it gives us revelation. It begins to open our understanding to the Scripture, it begins to transform us. To, to, to work righteousness in us means that we have to have the impurities burned out of our life in the Spirit of God. The power of the Holy Ghost is like a fire. It burns impurities out of our lives. So every day that we live for God, we, we are going through this metamorphosis. We're going through this transformation of God weeding out sin and weeding out bad habits and, and burning out impurities in our life. Thoughts and, and ways and actions that the enemy is trying so desperately to keep from, from changing. God is, God is working every single day. We go from glory to glory, from faith to faith by the Spirit of the Lord. As we behold in the glass the glory of the Lord, we are changed into His image. And that should be an everyday thing. And, and this Bible, this Word of God, that's the mirror that we look into. If we want to know who Jesus is, you can read about Him in the Word of God. And as we begin to read the things of God, we begin to go through the thing, the, the beauty of the Word of God, we begin to be transformed. So that transformation, every day that you're studying the Word of God, you're reading, that's why I encourage people, read your Bible every day. Get in the Word of God. You're being transformed. It's not just a one time. I went to church and I got a change or three, three months later I, went, I felt I got a good touch from God and I got changed. No, friend, we're being changed every single day. That's why the battle is sometimes is so intense. Other days, other days it's not. But we're going through this transformation. We got the world and all their satanic ideas that they're trying to download into our spirit. And we got the power of God that's fighting against that stuff, pushing it out of the way, trying to get it out of our life. And, and here we are right in the middle of it. And we're dealing with our, our physical emotions. We're dealing with our senses. And we're, we're feeling that struggle, the battle. And sometimes we don't know what to do with ourselves. And we're, we're going through this. But, but the Bible says, Paul said, Be not conformed to this world. Be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. There is a God that can renew your mind that when this struggle is taking place and this fight is taking place, that you can find yourself in a place of determination saying, Devil, you're not going to win. I have submitted my life to God. I have given my life to Christ. And I am going to live for God. To renew your mind, God begins to come against the lies that the devil's been trying to put inside your head. The thing of it is, you're worth it. And living for God is worth it. The Bible said there is pleasure in sin only for a season. But there is fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore in the presence of God. So what would you rather have? Pleasure for a season that's going to destroy your life or pleasures forevermore by serving God. And I hear Christians say this all the time. Oh, but the battle is so hard. The battle is so hard. 
You know, you know what that makes me realize? That's how valuable your life is. If the devil is trying so hard, if the devil is fighting so hard and the spirits of this world and the spirits of this age are fighting so hard for your soul, then that means your soul is worth something. That ought to make you look and say, wait a second, I'm not a failure. I have failed. I have succumbed to pressure. I've given in to pressure. But there's a power in me that is greater. Get back up. Fight your way through this thing and say, hey, wait a minute. I'm worth the battle. I'm worth fighting for. I'm worth doing this because I have a God who loves me with every fiber of his eternal being. He loves me and he is fighting for me. And there are times, my friend, that God has to chastise us. He has to. He did it with Samson. God had to put Samson through a metamorphosis, through a transformation in order to get his head right. And it was tough. Here's, let me just give you, I'm almost finished, but let me give you a meaning of the word transformation. It is a radical, thorough, and universal change, both outward and inward. A radical, radical. God can do radical things, my friend. Thorough. Whatever God starts, He finishes, and it's always perfect. And universal change, both outward and inward. Let me tell you something. God broke that man down. He took his strength. He took his vision. He allowed him to become a slave. I mean, God broke Samson down. All for the purpose of renewing his mind so he could save his soul. I'm going to tell you something. God will go to any length, my friend, to get you and I thinking right again. See, when God renews your mind, then transformation takes place again. God took Samson through a transformation to break him down. And then God began to renew his mind. And that renewed mind caused another transformation to take place. Samson stopped being proud and arrogant and became humble and repentive. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that absolutely the way God wants us he wants us humble. He wants us to be repentant. He wants us to, you know, He doesn't want us going through life thinking that we can just do whatever we want and, oh, God, I'm sorry, and, and oh, I did it again. Oops, you know, and here we go. No. Oh, I failed, you know. I'm never going to get it right anyway because I'm nothing but a failure. That's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. That's how the enemy wants you to think, but it's wrong. God wants us to be humble and repentant and say, you know what? I messed up, but I'm not going there again. I'm leaving it. Repentance means to turn away from something. So if I'm turning away from something, then how can I fall prey to it again? So it was in this place of renewal, in this place of this broken down man, that his mind began to come back to God. Just like Nebuchadnezzar in the Bible, how Daniel told him, he said, God's going to humble you. And he lost his mind. He became like a wild animal. For seven years. At the end of that seven years that God had said, at the end of seven years, I'm going to raise you back up. He switched just like that. But notice how he talked. Before he became a madman, he said, look at this kingdom that I have built. And it is clear in the Bible that God told him, he said, I've given you these kingdoms. God gives kingdoms. He raises people up. He tears people down. It's very clear. That's another sermon for another day. But when he came to his senses, when God made him go crazy and asked and basically what it was, God made him go crazy. When God brought him out of that, he began to glorify God and he was humble. So friend, don't get to the place. Don't get to the place where your mind is a wreck. For that, the Bible says that God will keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. We got to keep our mind on him. I mean, and when Samson's renewed mind came back when he when his excuse me when his mind was renewed and he came back to his senses god anointed him with strength one more time and it was the bible says when samson leaned and he pushed on those pillars and he brought the house down he killed and samson died along with it he killed more in his death than he did while he was alive when we die out to the things of this world that's when we are the most victorious when we die 
to the to the lies and the thoughts and mentalities. Who cares if they call you weird? Who who cares? Because our reward in heaven is so much greater than what one little pleasure down here can give. And listen to what the Bible says, and I'm closing with this. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, to the casting down of imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bring in every thought in obedience unto Christ Jesus. One day I, I want to I teach on that, but I just want to I just want to mention it briefly that, that that whole scripture is talking about the mind. For the weapons of our warfare. You I mean, you can't physically punch a demon spirit. We fight them in our mind. We fight them in the spirit. We fight them in the presence and in the power of the Holy Spirit working through our life. But it has to deal with our mind. This scripture, the weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal. They're mighty through God. To the pulling down of strongholds, to the casting down of imaginations. I mean, how many strongholds have we had in our minds that we've had to tear down? Ways that we were taught from a children or things that we, sins that we practiced that were strongholds that we had to tear down. To the tearing down strong, to the casting down of imaginations. Sometimes we let our imagination roam wild with us. And our imaginations are powerful. So that's another weapon that we have that we can fight against the enemy with, or it can become a vice for the enemy to use against us. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. All these professors, these atheist professors out here that are teaching garbage to our kids that are going to school saying, oh no, there, there, there's not a creator who created the earth. Oh yes, there is. You know, the, the, even Charles Darwin himself, and this, this is what I've heard, maybe I shouldn't say it, but you know, was without having verified proof, but denied the whole thing on his deathbed. You know, the, the, the world tries to cover up this kind of stuff. You know, and, and, but there is a creator. God created. And that's the bottom line, so they can fight all they want to with it, but that's things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. There's people that think they're smarter than God. I mean, but you know, and it's, it's foolish to, to us, but these are the spirits that we're fighting. And then bringing every thought in obedience, bringing every thought in captivity, in obedience unto Christ Jesus. So if you've got thoughts that are running away from you, you've got wild thoughts in your mind, or if the enemy's trying to influence your thought life, Put chains around those things and say, you know what? I'm bringing you to Jesus. I am submitting my mind to Christ. And he's going to renew my mind. I want to pray with you today. Um, and like I said, there's a lot that we can talk about on the subject of the mind. Um, and we, we may deal with it in, in later, later uh, programs or whatever, but... Um, Today, first of all, I want to just encourage the church. You know, don't 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 let all these things you hear on the news and and shutdowns and you know all this. There's stuff that's going to happen in the next few years and things. If we're not raptured out of here, that's it's going to be absolutely terrifying. I mean, it's going to be terrifying. It's going to be worrisome. It's going to be it's going to bother us. It's going to shake us and rattle us. But Jesus said, "Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid." So, so. Take no, take no thought of tomorrow, so don't let your mind run wild about tomorrow. He said, be anxious for nothing, so don't get anxious thoughts. I mean, there's so much in the Bible about our thinking. But I want to encourage our church today to, to set your mind on Jesus. Put your thoughts in a good place. Put them on the promises of God for your life. Put them on the Word of God. The, the best thing to do, and I'll be honest, learn the Word of God. Get it in your mind. Quote it, learn it, study it, repeat it until you begin to speak it out of your mouth. Whatever gets in your head is going to come out of your mouth as a man thinks in his heart or as a, as a man thinks, so he speaks, the Bible said. So get the Word of God in your head. Get it in there. Learn it. Get it in your head. Speak it out of your mouth and let the Word of God encourage you. And don't let these things bother you. Don't let these things get to your heart, soul, mind, and spirit. And reject these ideas of the world. Reject these mindsets of the world. Who cares about 
those liberals in, in Washington, and, and I know they're, they're, their ways bothers and irritate us, but greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. Keep that in your mind. Let's pray. Father, we love you today. And Father, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your word today. I thank you, Lord, that we can have a renewed mind, that we don't have to go through life with a tormented, messed up way of thinking, Lord, that is influenced by every wind and wave of doctrine that comes by or everything the enemy uh, says or the world says or these liberal mindsets say. Lord, I thank you for a mind that is influenced by the Word of God, that is influenced by the Holy Spirit, that is influenced, God, by the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, and I just pray right now that you would just give peace in our mind and that, Lord, you would begin to renew our minds. That, Lord, if we've lost strength today, that through that renewed mind, our strength will come back. If we've lost vision through a renewed mind, our vision is going to come back. If we are bound by something through a renewed mind, we're going to regain our freedom. So, Lord, I pray that you would bless today and bless those in our church, God, today that may be struggling with thoughts and ideas in their head, God, that you would give them that renewed mind, that they would not be conformed to this world, but they would know what is that perfect, good, and acceptable will of God. It is not your will, God, for us to, to be bound by thoughts in our mind, but it is your will for us, God, to preach the gospel, to live the gospel. And Lord, I pray for those that are watching today that are friends and followers. I pray, Lord, that you would minister to them today too, God, that are struggling with some of the same things. That, Lord, through this message and through this prayer, God, as we pray together right now, because, Lord, I feel your spirit. I feel the Holy Ghost on me right now. And I know that there is nothing that can hinder the Holy Ghost from moving through this prayer, moving through this message to where somebody is right now and, and transforming their mind. So, Father, I pray right now that your spirit would move upon them, encourage them, break the chains in their life, renew their vision, renew their strength, renew their mind. In the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. And God bless you today. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. And I just pray that you would be encouraged tremendously today. We look forward to coming to you again. At other times, we're going to be um, lots more that we want to share with you from the Word of God. And I know that it will encourage you. I know it's going to bless you. And I know that God is good. So let's stay encouraged. Greater is He that's in us than He that's in the world. Jesus told us many times not to be afraid. So let's start living what the Word of God says and realize that we have power over all the power of the enemy and nothing, Jesus said, shall by any means harm us. Amen. God bless you and we'll see you again soon.